This is Electric Universe Eyes, and today I'm going to narrate from the Daily Plasma, written by Andrew Hall, titled Cosmic Resonance. Proponents of Electric Universe theory face one seemingly infinite wall of resistance, the false preconceptions cemented in people's minds by consensus science. We do not see the cosmos the same way materialists do. Fundamentally, the cosmos is energy. Energy is kinetic motion, or potential motion of matter over a distance. But matter itself is potential energy, so it's just all one thing, energy. An electric energy is one of energy transformed from kinetic to potential by standing waves of constructive interference. Matter particles consist of holographic plasmodial interference patterns, standing waves in other words, that form the ether. Each standing wave is itself a circuit of energy shaped by its frequency. The shape of matter conforms to the shape of energy flow, and the shape of matter forms circuitry that anchors the shape of energy. It's a feedback loop. From our perspective, plasmoids are electromagnetic bubbles of potential energy, and hence the perception of a particle. On the inside, they are whirlwinds of trapped energy patterned into an infinite cyclic circuit. This circuit creates polarity, angular momentum, exchanges energy with its environment by induction, and maintains structural integrity with a membrane of capacitance. Its internal potential maintains resonant balance and therefore is in constant feedback with its environment. It is an RLC circuit. This circuit pattern repeats in self-similar scalar harmonics from the subatomic scale to the supragalactic. Therefore, an electric universe is luminous bubbles within bubbles, circuits within circuits, harmonies within harmonies vibrating a constant energy from within in resonance with everything without. Electric universe eyes see the cosmos as circuitry that patterns energy, frequency, and vibration. Circuitry is life. The feedback loop is universal. Entropy is energy dropping an octave. Infinity means as big as it needs to be. Gravity is an emergent consequence worthy of study, not worship. And we don't divide by zero. Minds that imagine energy as chunks of stuff bouncing around are unlikely to consider repeating, scalable, fractal interference patterns as evidence for anything but the, quote, mysteries of nature. They have been groomed all their lives to think what matters is matter. They will remain befuddled by duality and haunted by entanglement. They will disavow longitudinal waves and the ether. It's why consensus science can't explain ubiquitous patterns at every scale in the cosmos, like the Fibonacci sequence or the Mandelbrot set. It's just physics, but they try to sweep such evidence of circuitry in nature under the rug by calling it a mystery, as if it's something beyond science. It is they who have gone beyond science, beyond falsifiability, with dark stuff, wormholes, and multiverses. Breaking out of the mold that poisons quackadamia and hence the greater population requires more than waiting on its internal decay. Although that is happening at an accelerating pace, there is still a need to reorient people's minds to reality. They need new physical models they can visualize. Fortunately, great minds have already blazed a path. Their message has just been suppressed. I'm talking about people like Faraday, Maxwell, Heaviside, and Steinmetz. These are names that need no introduction in the electric universe, but let's add one more. Hans G. Schantz. Hans G. Schantz is with Q-Track Corporation of Huntsville, Alabama, and has written a paper titled, quote, On Energy Flow in Standing Waves. In this paper, Hans rediscovers the enlightenment of our electric pioneers. This paper examines the underpinnings of electromagnetism appropriately in the context of wavelengths, frequencies, amplitudes, harmonies, and the patterns that emerge as originally studied by the luminaries mentioned. In particular, this paper explores the pointing heavy side interpretation of energy flow in electric circuits, which basically says the energy isn't in the copper wires of a circuit, but flows through the electromagnetic, quote, lines of force around the wires. This is quite different from the conventional concept of electrons channeling through wires. This paper demonstrates, however, that the pointing heavy side interpretation is correct. This conclusion should be no surprise in the EU community. 
However, it's critically important to understanding the motions of a dusty plasma in free space. It's critically important for people whose concept of electricity is confined to the wires they plug into their appliances. The convention in science and engineering is to model electric circuits from a far field perspective. That is, to measure voltage, current, and resistance from point to point and ignore how the electron travels between. The scientists mentioned in particular developed methods to approximate with simple math what otherwise was too complex to be useful. But fidelity was lost about the pattern of actual energy flow, and hence the very perception of it, even for engineers and scientists. The paper illustrates the flow of energy and impedance in concert with voltage and current as a result of standing waves formed in the EM field in a simulated two-phase system. Although this is a very simple model, the patterns of energy flow are similar to patterns found in geology created by electromagnetic waves. It illustrates how energy flows like water, changing direction in zigzag patterns and circulating in whirlpools. These intricate, turbulent motions are ignored by convention. We cannot afford to ignore them, however, if we want to model weather in geology, or anything else, for that matter, in nature. As we've shown in previous articles, plasma storms patterned the face of the Earth by raising a global dust cloud and reapplying the constituents and patterns formed by electromagnetic forces. In other words, Earth is an electroplated planet. We have shown and discussed significant evidence that supersonic winds molded mountains, leaving distinctive, in fact, unambiguous patterns of shockwaves. We've shown and discussed evidence of canyons formed by sputtering discharge. And we've shown and discussed river channels formed by ground-to-ground -ground arc mode discharge and the evidence of resonant frequencies, hall effect, stray capacitance, line-to-line -line phase vectors, and other identifiable geometric effects in the discharge patterns. These are all near-field effects, effects that are not captured in conventional far-field analysis. Wind effects, in particular, are patterned by energy and power flow, and hence conventional far-field methods won't work. A quick dimensional analysis says wind is mass, forced to move over distance, energy, over time, power. To model the patterns of dusty plasma winds requires the methods of Messrs. Pointing, Heaviside, and Shantz. On energy flow and standing waves. Before you click his paper and die a small death of many equations, scroll past to the illustrations. Anyone who can see the patterns sees the result of electromagnetic forces, regardless of whether the equations are understood. I have included samples of the figures here for discussion. Energy flows a more torturous path than conventional models imply. It makes right-angle turns and eddies around pools of impedance into Z-pattern flows like water in a rocky stream. Just like shock waves reflect off of shock waves, EM waves reflect off of EM waves, creating interference standing waves in odd places, harmonics and traveling waves, transient standing waves. Geologic evidence of wind patterns left by supersonic shock waves and many other features confirms that plasma winds filamented into linear, Z-patterned, right-angle and circulating cyclones patterned by electromagnetic fields as well. Examine the interference patterns in Figure 5 from the paper and take special note of the total energy and impedance diagrams. The same type of energy flow molded the Laramie Mountains around the spectacular X discharge pattern at the heart of the range. Although the patterns are not identical to the examples in the paper, the angular relationships patterned in the landscape are the same because it was also created by an orthogonal electromagnetic field interference pattern. The patterns are more complex than the simple two-phase simulation, but so was the electromagnetic field of the plasma storm that created these mountains. The storm generated an electric field between the sky and ground at this particular location on the Continental Divide because of tension between circuit domains forming the Mississippi, Colorado, and Snake River watersheds. It was this hot spot in the ground that drew a response in the atmosphere by building a thunderstorm, one of Zeus's finest. Wind patterns, indicated in blue, show the path of energy flow along lines of force which we now know are interference patterns in a multi-phase EM field. The wind energy traveled in straight-line filaments at angles roughly 30 to 45 degrees offset to the orthogonal cross, just like the impedance is offset from total energy in figure 5, and for the same reason. 
The ground discharge pattern that made the orthogonal cross presents the ground phase, and the tropical layer of the storm cell above it presented the opposite end of the electric field, or the other plate of charge density in the capacitor, and the other phase in the EM field for this circuit. The cross itself is a discharge between the three ground domains and is anchoring the location and establishing the frequency of the circuit. As the discharge cycle from peak to trough, it presented a standing wave of maximum impedance over minimum voltage to the plasma winds. Plasma winds were biased positive and the ground negative. Winds were drawn by reactive energy flow of electric field inductance, capacitance, and magnetic field inductance, both leading and lagging the pulsing arc mode discharges on the ground. Magnetic field inductance drew filamentary jet streams toward the center of the cross and then up into the storm center. These jet streams followed magnetic waves vectored in the direction of the wave's motion, perpendicular to lines of force. Electric induction drew winds in curving paths, field aligned with magnetic lines of force, as shown in the figure below, and these winds deposited dust where ground charge attracted it in the act of electroplating. The patterns formed by a dusty plasma also influenced by the dust itself. The difference in ionic mix and the influence of magnetic or diamagnetic particles might make the difference between a clockwise or counterclockwise turn, or a fast or slow wind, or whether it sticks to the ground charge densities at a shock wave or blows right through. So to summarize, the orthogonal relationship of alternating electric and magnetic fields yields an X-shape constructive interference pattern of maximum reactive energy flow, and a vertical cross-shaped minimum energy pattern of maximum impedance. This pattern is repeatable, scalable, and expressions of it are identifiable throughout nature. The takeaway of this paper and what it illustrates about Earth is the phased interplay of reactive power in the EM field between sky and ground. The sky is reactive, lagging in phase to charge concentrations first established in the ground. Lightning, tornadoes, and storm cells are phase-to-phase -phase discharges in a multi-phase circuit, not DC dielectric breakdowns, nor anything to do with CO2. That is why consensus science can't understand weather. The Earth, like everything else in the cosmos, is a pattern of energy storage and flow. Follow the energy to any answer. That's how it's done with or without math. One can feel energy. When you add the complexities of spherical geometry and how waves propagate and interfere on a spherical capacitor that inducts energy from the poles, definable patterns appear. Take, for instance, these images of Iapetus. Iapetus has no atmosphere or internal geoelectric dynamic. What happened here was a direct current event. However, it serves to illustrate ground currents. What is obvious is a meridian of raised rock, called a dike, running from one pole to the other. A quarter turn, 90 degrees, around the moon is a similar pole-to-pole -pole meridian of aligned craters highlighted by the limb. Another smaller meridian of craters runs roughly between the larger craters and dike, about 30 degrees above the dike. Each is an expression of charge densities formed by filaments of current. Immediately, one should notice the quadrangle formed by interference. Here, from a polar aspect, the dike and major crater meridians parallel a quarter rotation apart from pole to pole, with a minor meridian of craters between. It is a similar three-dimensional quadrangle of power flow as the paper depicts in two dimensions, where the quadrangle is formed by constructive interference and then divided into eight sections by destructive interference, impedance. Each section forms its own pattern of charge densities because each section acquires a different ratio and vector of electric and magnetic field inductance due to phase and frequency differences. The craters formed on radial currents emanating from the moon's interior and aligned along these meridians as they pass through the crust. They form destructive interference, cathode spots, on the spherical field of the crust where energy deconstructed matter. The dike, on the other hand, is a meridian filament of constructive interference on the crustal surface that ran like a wire from pole to pole. Constructive interference means energy aggregates matter, where positive and negative ions came together and recombined. The energy was entering one pole and leaving the other, 
but reflecting its internal flow into multiphase interference, which patterned standing waves of voltage, current, and impedance from within to create these distinct geometrically aligned filaments as a rise in internal energy exceeded the capacity of the body. Atmospheric planets especially show consistent patterns of energy flow in their weather due to multiphase reactive energy. The V-patterned winds on Venus, the magnetic shadow on the Sun, and the continental formation of North America shown below are all the consequence of energy flows from a body that is inducting energy, storing it in layers of spherical capacity, and expelling excess through its own dynamic electromagnetic fields, forming these predictable interference patterns. Ground charge densities cause shield volcanoes to lay the continent's foundations on Earth and weather layered sediments on top shaped by the same reactive energy flows and interference patterns because the plasmodial circuitry in Earth, Venus, and the Sun are very similar. These patterns come and go. Other patterns emerge. Nothing is constant, but the patterns recur. They are interference patterns from internal circuitry that has its own cyclically operating switching mechanism. It's obvious, if you think about it, assuming you accept electrical formation in the first place, that Earth's land masses must be patterned by forces from within. If they were not, how would diffuse energy from space create the complex geography we see? By applying the same physics described in this paper, one can determine fine detail about geology on Earth. The cycles of catastrophe in Earth's past left patterns of plasma winds, sputtering and arc mode discharges, shock waves, and fringe effect currents around the continental plates, all patterned by Earth's own energy flow. Each episode laid a new layer on the old. Each layer, if properly interpreted, will yield a clear picture of what happened. Were there comets and asteroids colliding with Earth in cyclic patterns of recurrence? Or did Earth switch its circuit patterns periodically, perhaps due to solar influence? These are answerable questions. In the same way one can interpret prevailing wind patterns from the shape of a sand dune, one can interpret virtually any hill or dale on the planet. A record is retained in Earth's geology like a holograph because it was formed by standing waves. Now, thanks to the work of engineers and scientists like Hans G. Schantz, who are brave enough to challenge the consensus, we have the beginning of models to reinterpret our world. We can go to work rewriting science. Cheers. This was written by Andrew Hall. For more information, please visit thedailyplasma.blog.